When I was walking back from getting coffee, I was passing by the nurse's station and one of the ladies there stopped me and said, Sarah, what's your dad's number? I can't get a hold of him. And I said, oh no, I don't want you calling my dad. Um, you know, he is really tired. He needs to sleep. He needs his rest. You know, unless, you know, something really bad is happening, you know, I'd just rather leave him alone. And they're like, oh, well, okay. I was just told to call him. And I'm like, well, no, I'll call him if I feel like I need to call him. And that's how our conversation went. So I went back to the room. And before I walked in, I um, was talking to somebody else that was standing in front of the room. And we were just kind of talking and everything. And um, all of a sudden, one of the nurses uh, came out of the room. And she was crying. And I'm like, wow, what is going on? And... um. I said, I haven't called my dad yet because I don't want to call him unless it's an emergency. And she said, oh no, this is an emergency. And I'm like, why? What's happening? And she said, she's in process right now. And so that was a pretty big blow. Um, I freaked out. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Dad was supposed to go home and take a few hours um, and sleep for a few hours, I guess. But um, I guess I was going to call him back again. <laughs> I had to call him back. And so I called him back. He didn't answer. And um, I Luke just walked in and I told Luke, I'm like, Luke, they just said that she's in the process right now. I can't get a hold of Dad. And Natalie and one of the other ladies has Natalie and I can't deal with this right now. And, I was just a mess and I started, you know, making phone calls to family members. I called my Aunt Christy. I told her to tell the rest of the family and I called my brother. My brother was already driving back because he had already planned on coming back that night. And so he was already on his way and I'm like, Stephen, they just said that he's, she's in process right now and they don't know how much longer it's going to be. They're telling me that it could be um, overnight or, you know, that it's just close. And, you know, my heart was beating really fast. I didn't know how to handle this information alone. And I was just going crazy. All I knew to do was call everyone and let them know what was going on. Now, that night, I called Scott and made sure that he was, that he understood that, you know, I told him, I think I kind of panicked him. Of course, I was in a panic. I said, Scott, whatever you're doing, drop everything. Come now because they're telling us that mom's in the process of dying right now. And she may not make it through the night. And so Scott's like, okay, you know, <laughs> that's it. Um, so he was there that night too. And he was there the very next day with all of us. And um, he was there the next day too. And so, you know, Scott, that was very big for Scott. Um, after that third day of being there, he's like, I gotta go home. I can't do this anymore. And I understood, you know, I didn't want to be there anymore because just walking into that room every day, it was like, I didn't like that feeling. I guess I forgot to tell you that the night before um, Sharon and Stephen had come, uh, they put in a catheter. And um, that night was really hard. That night was very hard because um, the whole day was very difficult, but then to um, get to that moment where they uh, ordered them to put a catheter in her, that kind of, it was a relief afterwards, but when it was going on, when they were making that decision, or I guess the decision had already been made, but they were, you know, saying, okay, we're gonna do this. I looked at mom and I'm like, mom, are you okay with this? She had no expression on her face. She wasn't talking. But she just nodded her head like yeah i'm okay with this but i could tell on her face that she wasn't she was not okay she was not okay and um i feel the tears already coming <laughs> i remember i couldn't be in the room when that was happening so i walked out and i called my aunt alice and um I just had a complete breakdown <laughs> on the phone with her. That got her crying <laughs> and she was telling me that she it's really hard not being there. 
and I told her that it was actually really hard being there and watching this happen. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to be far away. I mean, I needed to be there, but it was still very, very hard to watch your own mom going through that. <laughs> My aunt had already started making plans to, you know, go down there because she lives all the way in Phoenix, Arizona. And so uh, she would have to make um, plans and a flight and, you know, all that stuff. And so she was going to try to do a few more days of work, but then make plans that weekend to come. And so that was her plan. Um, but then when I called everyone and said, OK, you know, this is it. They're saying that she may not make the night. Uh, that's when she uh, said, okay, I'm, you know, coming right now. <laughs> um, she tried making that flight that night, but um, there was um, no flight openings. And so she was on the first plane the next morning. And um, so, yeah, uh, everyone was in the room at that time. Uh, the th therapist was there. Um, the um, director of nursing was there. Um, a lot of people were there rubbing mom's shoulder, rubbing her chest. Um, they wanted, he, she wanted them to suction her out because she felt like there was, you know, something in her throat, but, um, they had nothing to suction out because they kept filling her airway and it was clear there was nothing there to suck out. And that's what they kept telling her that, you know, there's nothing there. It's, you know, just fear. Um, you just need to calm yourself down and you know all this. Mike was there. Our minister Mike was there and um, a lot of people were there surrounding mom and um, I'm sure she hated that. I'm sure she hated the fact that we were all there surrounding her but um, that's just the way it was and um, I'm sure she felt claustrophobic with everyone touching her arm, her leg, her hand and her feet, moving her feet, massaging her. Yeah, I'm sure she felt very uncomfortable with everyone, all the hands on her. But um, they were just trying to make her feel comfortable. Luke was there and he started playing um, Here I Am Lord on his phone. And hearing that song, it's such a beautiful song anyway. And <clears throat> hearing that song and everyone, you know, started singing it with, you know, the person singing on the phone. And, um, you know, it was just a moment <laughs> I'll never forget. You know, we were all around my mom. That song was playing, and I'm never going to hear that song the same way again without thinking of that night. Um, but it was a, it was a beautiful moment. And, um, so eventually people started to, uh, clear out of the room. Uh, people's shifts were over so they started to go home and um, it was just dad, me, and Stephen finally got there and um, I could tell Stephen was pretty upset. <laughs> um, Sharon called. Before everyone left, I forgot, Sharon called and she was freaking out because she, there was no way that she could just pick up and leave right then and there. She had a family to take care of. She couldn't just leave. And so she's like, um, you know, we can't leave right now, but we can leave first thing tomorrow morning. But, um, you know, they were telling us that she may not make the night. And so I told Sharon, you know, do what you feel like you need to do. But I'm just telling you, they're saying she may not make the night. And so um, she called back a few minutes later because she wanted... Sharon called back a few minutes later because she wanted Morgan to talk to her grandma one last time <sighs> um <clears throat> that was her youngest Molly's her oldest and Molly wasn't there at that time and so she couldn't put Molly on the phone but um when Morgan's voice came on the phone everyone started crying <laughs> it was just this little tiny voice that said hi grandma <laughs> and um yeah, it was very, very sad to hear Morgan's voice at that time because everybody knew what was happening and everything kind of settled down. Mom was calm. 
Uh, they gave her uh, some morphine to help calm her down more. Um, hospice was called just to notify them that this was what was happening. And uh, um, I guess there was nothing else for us to do. Steven said that he would take the night shift so Dad could go home and actually get some sleep. And then uh, um, Luke and I went home. Um... I guess I uh, told Steven, make sure you call us if something happens. If something's not right, if you think it's about to happen, call us immediately. And so he said he would. So um, around 3 a.m., um, he gave he called and said that um, her breathing pattern has changed, and if we want to see her, we should come right now. So, of course, I, you know, get out of bed. I tell Luke what's going on, so he's staying here with Natalie, and... I get out of bed and I run out of the house. Dad was already there by the time I got there. Her breathing had changed, but it was pretty steady at that time when we got there. And um, it hadn't changed again the rest of the day. So the rest of the day, um, she was with us. Sharon finally got there with um, her husband, Tim, and Molly and Morgan. Aunt Alice finally got there. So, you know, we had a full room. <laughs> Everybody was there. And mom was still some mom was still aware and she knew what was going on. She couldn't talk very well, but she knew what was going on. She knew she knew what was happening. And um uh she kept right at that time I think they were doing morphine. I think they were doing every hour or every other hour. I can't remember. But um they were definitely increasing her morphine at that time. One of the hospice aides had been in the day before or that day, I forget when, and they gave her a sponge bath but they didn't bother to take you know to change her clothes or anything and mom had some uh stains on the nightgown that she was wearing and so sharon and i are like all right well i guess you know we'll do it if they don't do it so um we started talking about it but we were sure if we you know we didn't want to disturb mom and then finally mom opened up her eyes and said what are you two talking about <laughs> And I had, like I said, we, you know, we had to be careful with what we said in front of mom because she heard, even though she wasn't opening her eyes, she was still listening. And so we, Sharon and I just kind of looked at each other. We kind of laughed and we're like, well, we were just talking about your nightgown and we were wondering if we could change your nightgown because it's dirty. And we asked if that would be okay. And she kind of nodded her head like, yeah, that's fine. So... I go down there to where I know her nightgowns are and I pick out a pink nightgown and um, the pink nightgown is uh, more of a sleeveless nightgown, um, just kind of a tank top type thing and um, I wasn't sure if that would be too cold or what and I kind of asked her if that's what she wanted but she really, you know, it, it was more difficult to get her to respond to every single question we had. <laughs> Um, she talked when she wanted to, she answered us when she wanted to, but if she didn't, she wouldn't. And so it was very hard to communicate with her the way that we wanted to. And so, um, she, uh, you know, we tried the blinking twice for yes, blinking once for no. We tried, um, nodding, but it, it didn't always work. And so we were having a very hard time communicating at that time. And it would shock us every time that she would talk because she wouldn't talk for so long. And then all of a sudden, you know, she would ask us a question and <laughs> it was kind of funny. But anyway, so Sharon and I changed her clothes and it was kind of funny. <laughs> you know, we were kind of awkward at it, but we got it done and we brushed out her hair and just made her look more presentable. We were putting lotion on her and made her feel good and massaged her foot because she was still wanting us to move her foot up and down. And, you know, that's all we could do is just make her as comfortable as possible. And um, I know Natalie was there sometime during that day, I think. And I do remember uh, Mom was awake and opening up her eyes when Natalie was walking across the room with our help. You know, she would have our hand and she would walk across the room, you know, holding onto our hand. And... I wanted to make sure that mom saw that and so I'm like look mom Natalie's walking look at her and you know mom kind of smiled and she nodded her head and so I know that she saw Natalie walking across the room with my hands <laughs> um so that was really special for me to know that she saw that um 
you know, that's all we could do was to make sure that mom got to spend as much time with Natalie as possible at that time because we knew that it was going to happen soon. We just didn't know when. The days kind of went on like that. The next day, uh, Tim took Molly and Morgan into Wichita to stay with some friends because they didn't need to be at the rest home all day. They would be, you know, going crazy <laughs> if they had to stay there all day. That first night, Aunt Alice and Stephen took the night shift and, um, something about 3 a.m. We got another phone call at 3 a.m. Uh, because her breathing had changed. And so they called me and then they called Sharon and then they called dad. And so we all three uh, drove to Hilltop around 3 a.m. Nothing happened. Again, nothing happened. Uh, Stephen was saying that, you know, if you want to see her, you know, you better come here quick. But nothing happened. Um, her breathing had changed. Um, she was gasping for air and um that was the night that they also went to every 30 minutes with her morphine and so she was getting morphine a very strong large dose of morphine every 30 minutes 